Ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews and Shebrews, welcome to the Life Podcast. So I'm your host, Luke Abafi, and today's guest is TJ Morris. TJ Morris is the founder of Bear, the Bear Independent YouTube channel. It's a preparedness YouTube channel. And he's also the founder of Refuge Medical. Um, he's also the founder of Grindstone Ministries and Caleb House. Now, I've got to give a short disclaimer about this interview. Bear doesn't shy away from foul language. Now, during the interview, he did his best to self-edit, which thank you for doing that, Bear. But this interview in particular, I probably wouldn't let kids watch, not because of the foul language, because we bleep it out, but because of the content. Bear is dealing with and confronting the worst people in the world. As I kind of listened to this again, I realized that it was one of the most important conversations that I had ever captured on video. And I'm honored to be able to share it with you today. So without further ado, I present to you TJ Morris. TJ, thank you for being on the Life Podcast. I'm glad that you're here, man. Bless you, brother. Thank you for having me. It's great to meet you. And Same. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a fan of your work, oh. and I was telling you off camera, um, I I don't I don't know if you know how impactful your work has been, and it's been really positive in the Torah observant and Torah curious community. The way DVD uh, to be able to share that as as somebody who's new to this faith, a to have the confirmation that I'm not alone and I'm not crazy, and then b if people aren't quite capable of articulating what they believe and what they're feeling and how the spirit is working on them to have a second witness, to be able to hand that DVD to somebody, that their parents, their husband or wife, their best friend, their pastor and go, look, like this is what I'm going through. Right. And so it's, I've given that DVD to dozens of people. I actually keep a copy of it in my briefcase that if somebody has questions, I'm like, watch this. Right. And I've I've had people come back with tears in their eyes. Thank you. I'm like, bro, oh, don't thank me. I just bought it on the internet and gave it to you. And so thank you for doing that because uh, you may not be aware of the impact that you've had on a lot of people's lives. And if it's one person's life, well done, good and faithful servant. And I can tell you personally, it's dozens that I know. So good job, bro. Whoa, thank you, man. <laughs> thank you. Praise you <laughs> Amen. He's guided it all and ever, you know, I just kind of tried to muddle through. <laughs> <laughs> What's that like? <laughs> um, I'm still doing it. <laughs> I've been bad doggy paddling for a while. No, no, it's going all right. <laughs> so, man, can you tell us one of uh, the main question I would ask in the way is this is what how did you come into this understanding of the Bible? Okay. Boy, I'll try and give you the Cliff Notes version of this. So I was uh, born and raised in the conservative Baptist church. I ran away, uh, literally and figuratively, at 15 years old because I saw a bunch of people who claimed the name of Christ that were not acting at all Christ-like, and that infuriated me. Um, kind of the catalyst of that was my best friend's parents got a divorce, and they... and. <laughs> We'll talk about, I understand people a lot better now. I was 15, but uh, his father was sleeping with another woman in the congregation that wasn't his wife and they got a divorce and his parents fought tooth and nail over who was gonna get custody of his sister and neither one of them wanted him. And so they came. To, he came to live with us and that really pissed me off. I mean, I was just infuriated. And I, I remember saying to myself, if this is what it means to be a Christian. I don't wanna be a Christian. This is stupid. Um, uh, what's the first command? Be fruitful and multiply. And so you've got these kids and you're clearly valuing one way higher than the other. And so at the time, as the father's plan would have it, the, uh, the drummer in the youth group band in this church, Kenny, joined the, joined the Navy. And he had this drum set that he was selling for 300 bucks. Snare drum, two toms, floor tom, kick drum, Camco double bass pedal, same pedals that Lars Ulrich from Metallica was playing at the time and cymbals and everything for 300 bucks. And so I scraped together 300 bucks. And uh, in the in one day, I heard Master of Puppets by Metallica and Cowboys from Hell from Pantera. In one afternoon, I'm like, what is this? My buddy goes, this is heavy metal. I'm like, this is me, dude. And so I would take a pillow and set it on the floor next to the drum set and put my 
Sony CD player on top of it so the vibrations wouldn't make it skip. Then I put on headphones like what Nate's wearing and I would play along and I taught myself to play metal. Well, not long after that, a bunch of grungy dudes twice my age showed up at my door, literally, and they're like, hey, uh, this is like before the internet, right? Like, hey, uh, we heard you play drums. You want to jam sometime? Yes, I do. So I've got these like 30 year old dudes like drinking beers, like Marshall half stacks set up in my in my uh, bedroom and a little Tascam four track recorder and we start cutting demos. Well, it grows and it grows and it grows. And next thing you know, fast forward, I'm a, I'm a professional drummer in addition to all the other things I was doing. I was a professional drummer in satanic heavy metal bands. And if it's bad for you or bad for somebody else, I've probably done it. I'm one of the few people I know that has spent more than a million bucks on cocaine um, in two years. I blew $1.4 million on cocaine and bourbon in two years. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sex, drugs, and heavy metal, dude. Um, and crazy. Uh, you open, you don't realize you're doing it, but you're opening doors metaphysically to spiritual evil that you're unaware of. And my life was a mess, absolute mess. And I had uh, finally given up the coke. One of my best friends had overdosed and died. And I had given up the coke and I was in, in the midst of just like the worst withdrawals, not even physically. I can deal with physical pain, it's not a thing. But emotionally, mentally, spiritually, I was just in a really dark place. I was in upstate New York and uh, I remember it was pouring rain and like 34 degrees outside, really cold. It's just a matter of time before the air turns and this will be snow, right? I'd gotten into a huge fight with my girlfriend and I was leaving the house and I walked outside into the pouring rain, completely soaked. And I was walking down to my truck because I was going to go get in my truck and kill myself. I just, I've had enough. And I'm walking towards my truck and I'm surrounded by woods. It's dark. And there's this little freaking white light just bouncing in and out of the trees. I remember thinking, what the hell is that? And it exploded. And there standing in front of me was this 15 foot tall seraphim. And I'm standing in the presence of this beautiful thing. So beautiful, I can't actually look at it in the face, but I knew it was gorgeous. Covered, bathed in white light and I'm warm. And in here, and in here, I hear we see you, we love you, it's gonna be okay. And it felt like an hour I stood in the presence of this thing, just warm, comforted, not in despair, and then it collapsed, a little white light bounced away. And I got in my truck, and I'm sitting there with my head on the steering wheel, weeping, tears of joy. My whole life, I've seen, for whatever reason, the Father has allowed me to see metaphysical things. I've seen hundreds of demons, unclean spirits, black things, hundreds of them. And they've tormented me my whole life. This is the first time I saw something that Yah made, that Yah ordained. It's like there is some positivity in the world. So I've got my head on the steering wheel, weeping. And then I realize... My jeans are getting wet from my tears. I can feel the tears soaking into my jeans. And I look down and I'm completely dry. I've been standing in the rain. I was soaked the moment I walked outside. And I'm sitting in my truck as this thunderstorm is raging around me. Having just been outside, bone dry. Every stitch on me. And that was the first time I really knew that there was something to God, to Yah. It wasn't just make-believe, it wasn't a fable, it's not pretend that he is real. And if that thing that I just saw is simply a minion for him, just somebody that works in his organization, it's not even him, and that's a shadow, a sliver of the greatness of him, I should probably get my poop in a group and start <laughs> serving him. And so, it wasn't an overnight turn by any means. Uh, fast forward many years after that, I had, I'd met my wife and we were in North Texas and my neighbor around the corner uh, had come over for one of my kids' birthday parties. 
and she birthday party's wrapping up, and she said, hey, um, my husband Michael is the associate pastor at this little church over here. We meet in a middle school cafetorium, half cafeteria, half auditorium, depending on the context, right? And I was like, okay. And she said, uh, I would love it if you would be our guest. A couple of Sundays from now, he's going to give the message. And I understand if you don't want to come, but um, I would love it if you'd be my guest. And, and if you don't come, that's fine. We love you all. We're very happy to have you as neighbors. Just consider it. Okay. Well, as y'all would have it, that Sunday rolls around and I'm home alone. My wife and kids are out of town. And so I got up, I drank a pot of coffee. I got changed three times because I don't know what people wear to church. I've been in church in a couple of decades, right? And finally, I was like, screw it, man. Work boots, jeans, T-shirt. If they don't like that, that's me. Screw them. And so that's how I went to church. And I got there and I sat right in the front row. The only seat was open was right in the front row, this far away from the pastor. And he just started preaching, man. Hellfire and brimstone. And I'm physically shaking. In the because whatever was inside of me could not stand to be in the presence of this light, just violently shaking. And my fight or flight is broken, it's been broken my whole life. I have fight or fight, like I'm really bad at running away, very stubborn. And so, the moment he prays us out, Amen, I'm like, Woof, out the door, can't take it. So, I get home, and my wife is back from being out of town, and she said, Well, so how was church? I said, I hated it. She goes, okay. I said, I got to go back and you got to come with me. She's like, who the hell are you and what have you done with my husband? I said, babe, we got to go. So next Sunday rolls around, we go back and uh, I'm holding her hand and she's holding mine. We're right there in the front row. We're just both shaking, right? We get done and we scoot right out the side door as soon as the message is over. We're sitting in the truck. I said, babe, what did you think? She goes, oh, God, I hated that. I said, yeah, me too. She says, we got to go back. I'm like, I know. We got to go back. So we went back third weekend, right? In the mouths of two or three, let a thing be established. So we go back <laughs> third weekend, and we're just clutching each other, just shaking like a bunch of freaking unholy sinners in the front seat, you know? And the spirit is working hard on us. And uh, our, our modus operandi at this point is like, gut it through the message, run out the front door, right? And so the message is over and we're about to run out the front door and the pastor stops me in the hallway. And he says, hey, I understand you're a drummer. Shit. Yeah, I'm a drummer. I said, we've been in prayer for a drummer for the worship band for two years. Would you prayerfully consider drumming for us? I grew up in the church. Prayerful consideration is a direct command from a pastor. That's what that is. It's just a very polite way of saying, we need you to do this thing. I said, yeah, I'll consider it. And he gave me his card with his email address on it. So we go back to the house and I'm sitting on the couch. I'm just torn uh, between what the spirit is doing working on me and what my flesh wants. And I told my wife, I said, hey, um, I think I need to play drums. She said, then do it. I said, I don't want to. She said, then don't. I said, but I need to. She said, well, then do it. And so we're going back forth. She goes, shut up and make a decision. Yes, ma'am. And so me thinking I could sneak out of this thing, I pull up the email app, and I scoot over to YouTube, and I grab a half a dozen videos of me playing drums in these metal bands. And I send them to the pastor. I was like, here's the kind of music I play. Are you sure you want this? So he forwards it to the worship leader. Ten minutes later, I get an email back forwarded from the pastor, from the worship leader, that said, oh, hell yeah, get this guy. This is awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, unbeknownst to me, the worship leader had at one point in his life been a professional Elvis impersonator. Talk about stage presence, right? And uh, the one guitarist was on to like ACDC and Nirvana. The bassist was a huge Nirvana fan. The keyboardist like loved Iron Maiden and power metal. Um, and so I'm like, this could work. And so we would get constantly, I know, I'm answer, long answer to your short question. We would constantly uh, be berated at rehearsal to play it the way it's recorded. Just play, guys, just play it the way it's recorded. Sure, sounds great. Well, you can't stop me Sunday morning. 
So Sunday morning would roll around, quick four count, we'd go in and we'd be playing heavy metal, hard rock versions of all these worship songs. <laughs> and uh, people would come up to me afterwards and be like, dude, that was incredible. I've never heard that song played that way before. I'm telling you, know, like, you know, that song Oceans, right? We're playing it twice the tempo with like <laughs> double bass and like blast beats and stuff. And the keyboard is going crazy. And, um, We'd get the occasional side look from the pastor. It's like, whatever, bro, we're here now. I can't do that. What are you going to do? Stop, stop, stop. And so, but people would come up to me and they'd say, um, I've never heard it played that way. That was incredible. What were you doing? I don't know. I would literally have like an 18 minute out of body experience every time. I don't know what I was doing. But Monica, her husband, he worked the soundboard and he would always kick us uh, media files where he'd been recording what we were doing. And I go back and listen to him and be like, that's incredible. <laughs> we were doing that? That's nuts, right? But it was the spirit flowing through us. And so the pastor came to me about a year afterward and he said, hey, um, we're going to be doing some baptisms coming up. And I really think you need to consider being rebaptized because I was baptized when I was younger. Um, and I, I'm now a, a firm believer in it. This is an outward acknowledgement. Baptism is of an inward heart condition, and it's a sign of a covenant. I didn't know any of that when I was first baptized. I was like, yeah, I should probably do that. And so I got baptized in front of the whole church. And this is just Sunday church, non-denominational, evangelical, spirit-filled, preaching the word. And this is the belief system that we're now into, which is awesome because everything's a game of degrees. And so I, I almost, not that I know the heart of the Father, right? But I can see shadows of the way that he works. How do I get this godless heathen out of like satanic death metal and black metal back over here into belief, right? I can't just pull him from one end of the spectrum to the other. So I have to shift the Overton window. And so here we are in Sunday church. I get rebaptized, and um, about a year after that, the messages that we were getting at the church had devolved from reading the word and dissecting the word and studying the word into essentially um, self-help motivational sermons. Here's three ways you can love your brother and the Lord this week, right? And we'd like, might, we might touch on a verse out of Matthew or something, maybe Luke, if we're feeling a little expeditionary, right? And that was it. And it was an hour of the pastor talking, but not preaching. And I still love this guy. Um, I've got nothing against him. But I went home and I told my wife, I said, we're not going to church anymore. Um, she said, why? I said, because he's not reading the Bible. I can read the Bible at home. That's not what's happening in that church anymore. And so we didn't. And so for about six months, we stayed home, didn't go to church. Sundays were our days again. And I woke up one Sunday morning and the spirit just crushed me, it said, go to church. And here I am arguing with the creator of the universe. No. I don't, I don't do that anymore. Go to church. Yeah, but we don't do that. Boy, did I stutter, go to church. Okay, dad. So I go in and wake my wife up. I said, hey, get up, we're going to church. Get the kids dressed. She's like, what are we doing? We don't go to church anymore. So we do today. And um, so we went back to church after about six months of not being there. And as the father would have it, we always sat right up front. We hadn't been there in half a year, so somebody else had taken our seats, and the only seats that were available were all the way in the back. And unbeknownst to me, the pastor and the eldership had been at war quietly for about 18 months. And it all came to a head that Sunday morning where people were hurling insults from the pulpit down to people in the body and back and forth. And the church's motto was, that's what family does. We were family. We were a small church. And it had grown and grown and grown to a couple hundred people. And sitting all the way in the back, I had the perspective of being able to watch 200 people that claim to love each other in Christ stand up and start picking sides between the pastor and the eldership. And I was disgusted. I was just and furious. And anger has been my stumbling block or my superpower my whole life. I've had a very complicated, violent upbringing. And uh, I was so freaking pissed. And I snatched my wife up and my kids and said, we're done here. 
let's go. And I went, I went home and I was so hurt because I had finally, finally found God again. I was finally surrounded by people that I loved and that who loved me for who I was. And it all just fell apart in the morning. And so I was left with just a handful of logical conclusions. God's real, his son's real, and the Bible is true. And so I started just reading the Bible for myself. Where should one start? In the beginning. Elohim created the heavens and the earth, Genesis chapter 1, 1. And so I just started reading. And then again, I was really pissed off this whole period of my life. And I would see things like a law forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. I'm like, nobody told me this. And now I'm even more pissed off. How come nobody told me this? And then the father would rebuke me. Hey, how long have you owned a copy of this book? And this is the first time you ever read it for yourself. It's nobody's job but your job to read it. You have subcontracted your faith to another man rather than being in covenant with me. And so he's just pounding me with these realizations. And I'm reading through there and I'll see like Leviticus 11. This is food. This is not food. Okay, I'm going to eat food. I'm not going to eat not food. Leviticus 23, Moedim, the appointed times, the first of which is the Sabbath, Shabbat, which we know in the book of Genesis is a sign. It's a wedding ring between the father and his people. So I'm going to start doing this. And my wife thinks I'm crazy while this is going on. And um, we're six months into this thing where I'm keeping the Torah inside of my house and she's not. And I had told my wife, I said, this is something that I'm doing. This may become something that we're doing, but I'm not going to ask you to do this until I can explain it. And right now, I don't logically understand it. The spirit is working on me to do these things, which is how I know it's Yah, because I'm an incredibly logical person. I'm not a very emotional, spirit-filled person, but I was being led by the Ruach to do all these things that I couldn't explain. I didn't have the biblical context and the depth of knowledge to explain why we eat food, why we don't eat not food, because they're parasitical cul-de-sacs and they'll make you sick. And the Torah is about the preservation of life, so don't get sick, right? Why do we keep Shabbat? Because, oh, scientists are just discovering that your body has a natural rhythm where you should rest one day per week. Cool. And every few months, you should take a week off if you can. Got it. The Moedim, the appointed times, tracking, right? And, but I couldn't explain all that. And so finally, my... Uh, my wife and I are, we're not in contention. She's honoring my wishes inside of the house, but I'm the only one in my house keeping Torah. And I was doing dishes one night in the kitchen and my coffee pot was off to the left of the sink. And I would take my phone and put it on top of the coffee pot and just let YouTube videos play while I'm doing dishes. And I was following this channel called Viking Preparedness about preparedness, Pastor Joe Fox. And I watched some video about, I don't know, some prepper stuff. And up next, the next suggested video, same dude, different channel, Shofar Mountain. Okay, whatever. I hit the phone with a soapy finger and whatever. And it was a sermon that Pastor Joe preached called Withdraw and Prepare. And it was the first time I knew of anybody else on the face of the earth that was reading the Bible and doing what it said which I now know is called keeping Torah. I didn't even know that term. I didn't know what Torah was. And so I'm washing this dish. It was a white dish with a yellow border. And I still remember it. And I looked up through the ceiling to Yah. And I said, is this what you need me to see? And he said, yes. So I keep listening and I'm getting crushed by the spirit. I remember throwing the dish into the sink. I like ran like a little girl out of the kitchen, around into the hallway, and put my back up against the wall in the hallway, and collapsed, started sobbing. Because it was the first time that I realized I wasn't alone, that there were other people out there that had this understanding as well. And then, like only a, a loving father could do, Yah speaks to me and goes, yeah, buddy, you're not that special. You think I'd tell only you? <laughs> Like, yeah, tracking, rebuke received. Okay. And so, and then I, I had questions because I was brand new to this. I didn't know 
a lot of these things. Well, how do you, for example, Leviticus 11 is compared to, you know, Matthew 15. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of it. It's still not a debate about food. Read the whole chapter. It's about ritual hand washing. That's what the chapter begins and ends with. But I didn't have that depth of knowledge. So I'm, I'm emailing Pastor Joe Fox at Viking Preparedness, these deep biblical Torah-based questions. And I would get like a two-word response. Read Corinthians. Okay? So I'd go plow through all of Corinthians. I'd be like, but what about this? I'd be like, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay? And I'd go, and so this goes on for a few months. And finally, instead of getting like two words, I started getting a sentence. Like, oh, we're making progress here, right? <laughs> and so I'd, I'd email him back, and then I'd get another sentence. And then finally a couple of sentences, and then a full-blown paragraph. Half a year later, I get a full-blown paragraph back from Pastor Joe Fox of Viking Preparedness. And he invited us. At this time, we had um, we'd been murdering our debt and crying out to Yah, we don't want to live in North Texas anymore. I got to get out of this place. This place is Babylon, man. Um, it's dangerous. And I don't want to raise my kids here. It's dangerous. And not dangerous like the Crips and the Bloods are shooting it out in the street, but the ethos of this place is dangerous to raising a healthy family. We got to get out. And so we'd been uh, murdering our debt, saving money, praying for a piece of land. And the father provided one um, here in eastern Oklahoma. So we moved out to eastern Oklahoma, completely alone, by ourselves. And Pastor Joe sends me an email and says, hey, we're going to do Shabbat services at Shofar Mountain. Uh, if you guys would like to come attend, here's our rules. Here's the location. Why don't you guys, paraphrasing a bunch of email back and forth here, we do Shabbat at noon. Why don't you guys come at 10? We'll spend the morning together. We'll fellowship. We'll eat a meal. You guys can leave in the afternoon, get to know each other. Praise Yah. And so we load up the kids in the car. We go to Shofar Mountain. And uh, me and PJ kind of do the circling each other, sniffing each other's butts kind of thing, exchanging bona, exchanging bona fides. And um, I said, hey, look, I think all your prepper stuff's cool. I'm not here about that at all. Not even a little bit. Um, I need to know the word of Yah. And I need a man to instruct me in the word of Yah. And I'm going to check everything you say against the Bible to make sure it is the word of Yah. Because I am done letting other people tell me their doctrines and dogmas and what they think it means. I need to know what the word says. And he got this lopsided former special forces grin on his face and he goes, good. I was like, I'm in the right place. And so, and see that's, what do you have brothers for? Reproof and instruction. Why did Yah become flesh in Yeshua so that we have somebody to look upon to model that behavior for us? 1 Peter 2.21, For this you recall that Messiah, having suffered for your sins, that you might walk in his steps. Do what he did. Right? What would Jesus do? Keep Torah. That's what he would do. Um, and so not having that fullness of understanding, being, being brand new to this walk, having a pastor and brothers that weren't new to this to help walk me through this is why we do this. This is what this means. This is, you know, and we're, we're super blessed as a congregation that while we do have a pastor, Pastor Joe, and I'm now an ordained pastor as well, um, we do not allow men to abdicate the throne of responsibility inside of their own homes. You are the priest of your home, and you don't get to push off your homemade BS on me. You need to lead your home. I can help you learn how to lead your home, but I can't come lead your home for you. That's not my job. And so having strong brothers around you for reproof and instruction so that you can learn to step into the, the role that Yah made you for in the first place as a biblical man in service to Elohim has been really good for me. And that's a big part of what we do now as well through Bear Independent and through Refuge and through the ministries uh, because it's, there's a pandemic of men not stepping into their calling. If Yah didn't need you, why did he make you in the first place? If he wanted you to be a girl, he would have made you a girl. He didn't make you a girl. He made you a man. And there are, there are rules and instructions for a man of Elohim contained inside of this book. And that was modeled perfectly by Yeshua when he walked the earth. So that we can look to the model that Yeshua set and go, I need to do that. And it doesn't mean don't have compassion, because you should. Every time Yeshua heals somebody, it's always preceded by, and Yeshua had compassion on them. And they were healed. But he also wasn't a pushover. He goes to the Temple Mount and sees people buying and selling on Shabbat. 
leaves, premeditated, braids a whip of cords, John chapter 3, and then comes back. So this whole like, well, he was in a righteous rage. Yeah, for how long? He observed, left, made his whip, came back and started flipping tables and grabbing people by the throat and throwing them out. So there's a time and a place for that as well. What would Jesus do? Flip the tables in your bookstore in your church. That's what he would do. And we've, we've lost in many ways uh, our calling as biblical men, as men of Elohim, because we have, uh, I've been admonished to watch my language during this. So we've got a bunch of sopping wet P words that are leading from behind the pulpit in their mauve colored polo shirts, not preaching the word of God, trying to talk men into, if you just be a really nice guy, then maybe you can ascend to a follower of Christ. That's not what I see in the Bible at all. These were men, and we're supposed to be men. And it doesn't mean don't have compassion, don't have emotion. But what does meekness literally mean? Literally, it means you have a sword, and your hand is upon your sword, but you keep your sword in your sheath because you're, vi you're balancing the capacity and capability for violence against wisdom and discernment. Look in the, the Leviticus, man, the Levites. Um, in Exodus, when uh, Moshe comes down off the mountain and he sees this golden calf that Aaron had made. Levites, put your sword upon your thigh, go throughout the camp north to south, east to west, and slay every man, your brother, your brother, who's, who has bent the knee to Baal. <sighs> we've lost that. Um, we've lost that in Christendom. And I'm not calling for violence or warfare. And I'm, I'm not a fear monger at all, but men have lost what it means to be a biblical man, to have the capacity for violence. We have a very simple role for a, a man as it's outlined in Genesis. Man was created to rule and subdue. That's why Adam, Adam was made, to rule and subdue. And then there's under that heading, provision, protection, blessing. That's what a man is to provide. He's to be a conduit for provision, protection, and blessing to his house, to his family, to everybody inside his sphere of influence. If I can't lead in my house, I can't lead you, brother. Right? So it starts here with me and my wife and my children, and then it spills over and outward from there. And people get this concept of headship screwed up as well. I'm the head, but there's a difference between dominion and domination. I have dominion over these things. Think of a field, right? I'm going to go harvest this field. Dominion is stewardship. I need to make sure that there's not tares in my wheat field. Domination is hook up the mower. I'm going to go mow it all down and destroy everything that's here. Dominion is I'm responsible to Yah for my wife and children. I will answer at the end of an age for how well I protected, provided for, and blessed my wife and my children. That's dominion. My wife is a badass daughter of Yah and was before she was my wife. She belongs to him. And I get to, I have the pleasure of stewarding her. My children belong to him. I have the pleasure of stewarding them to raise them up in the way that they should go so that they do not depart from it when they are older. That's dominion. Domination is crushing people. And we shouldn't dominate as men, but we should have the intestinal fortitude to take dominion over the responsibilities that the Father has given us, rather than abdicating that responsibility to whoever the lowest bidder is that makes us feel good on Sunday morning, because they've got a great worship program, and the kid, the child's ministry is excellent. Who cares? Are they preaching the word of Yah? And is that word of Yah empowering you to be the best husband and father that you can, to rule and subdue, to take dominion, to shoulder that responsibility, the burden of being a man willfully, proudly, executing in the Father's will to be a blessing to everybody else around you. So, long answer to your short question. That's how I got into Torah. <clears throat> That's <Apologies>. awesome. <laughs> no, that is awesome. <laughs> I'd like to follow up on your last comment about men in the world and in Christendom. Yep. I'm curious if you've thought about how we got here, because I feel like back in the 20s, 30s, it probably wasn't exactly like this. Mm -hmm. And and if you've also thought about what what's the best solution to this, 
two, you know, re manlying men. <laughs> <laughs> so let me try and keep this concise to the best of my broken ability. I'm not known for brevity, so I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, it's how did we fun. get here? I think in large part, it's due to bad teaching. Um, and again, men are subcontracting their faith to other men. Many people in the Torah movement come out of Christendom, right? The, the, the milk and the meat. They, they go into a denominational church. They get saved. That word is redeemed, by the way, bought and paid for with a price that you now become a bondservant inside of a house that's not yours. Yeah. Why did Yeshua have to become flesh so that you would have a brother to redeem you to pay a price that you couldn't pay? It's Torah. There's a Torah for redemption. But they get into church. They get saved. They confess their love for Messiah, all of which is good. Um, and then they're stuck on the milk. And in the Gospel of Luke, Yeshua asks Peter, who has just renounced him three times, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Master, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Master, I love you. Shepherd my flock. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Master, I love you. With tears in my eyes, I love you, Master. Feed my lambs. Those are not the same thing. I have sheep. You can't feed a lamb what sheep eat. Lambs are on milk. High energy, easy to digest, non-denominational evangelicalism. They've got a great worship band. The little ones are on milk. If you feed them the meat, you feed them grain or hay, they bloat and die. It's too much. They can't handle it. Hmm. At some point, the mother's sheep, the ewe, weans that lamb. And it's not an enjoyable process. She literally kicks the lamb off of her. So it no longer has access to the milk. And it's forced to begin eating meat, grain, hay, grass, whatever it can. And there's a literal biological change that takes place in this animal where it goes from being a lamb to being a sheep. Sheep will starve to death on milk. It doesn't have the nutritional density. They have to eat something more substantial. So what you feed a lamb is different than what you feed a sheep. And shepherd my flock is all of these together. Everybody inside of this penfold, this whole flock, the young, the old, the sick, the healthy, the good genetics, the bad genetics, all of them, this flock as a whole. And so what Yeshua is encouraging Peter to do here is take care of everybody but there's a difference in how you take care of them. I can't feed a lamb what sheep will eat, and I can't feed sheep what a lamb will eat. And so a lot of men coming up through Christendom have been fed milk their whole life. And their understanding of faith and their relationship with the Creator and their relationship with Messiah is all predicated on this milk teaching. There's a lot of falling away from the church because people don't feel like they're being fed. That's the weaning process, and it's an uncomfortable process where the source of the milk has to kick you off so you will go find meat. You have to go eat something more substantial to stay alive. So men have been indoctrinated in this, just be a really nice guy. If you wanna be like Jesus, just be a really nice guy, right? Don't, and it, you'll see a twisting in the teaching of the fruits of the spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, you know, the, the fruits of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit are patience and love and kindness and all those are great, they are. I can also flip to Samson, who was overcome by the spirit and killed a thousand dudes with the jawbone of an ass. Shamgar, old guy with a pointy stick. Spirit comes over him. He slays 700 Philistines. Okay, same spirit. It's the spirit of Elohim, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. It's the same spirit, which means there's got to be more than a single facet of what it means to be indwelt with the spirit as a man of Elohim. Elijah slayed 450 false prophets of Baal. And by the way, trash talking is on the menu. Oh, I'm sorry, is your God asleep? He must be on vacation. Maybe if you cut yourself and scream louder, you can wake him up. Allowable. Elijah did it, right? And so, and people will say, who do you think you are, Elijah? No, I wish that we were all Elijah. I wish that whatever giftings and talents and delights the Father created you with, that you were executing on them with so much tenacity and fervor that it's undeniable that you are a man of Elohim. Yeshua talks about nobody lights a lamp and puts it underneath the basket, let your light shine. Okay, what's the light? Proverbs 6.23, your command is a lamp and the Torah is a light unto my feet. 
let your light shine, right? So go out there in the world and actually execute as a man. And that's not the message that people are getting in the Christian church. And in a lot of ways in the Torah movement, people aren't getting that message either because we've all come out of the church. And so we're dragging this legacy of bad teaching and doctrines and dogmas with us. You should have the capacity to be a really nice guy, 100%. You should have compassion and love you should be able to empathize with people. You should also, if somebody's threatening you or your family, or your livelihood, understand sometimes you need to pick up the jawbone of an ass because I'm responsible for these people. And if I don't take responsibility for provision, protection, and blessing of the people that Yah gave me to steward, they belong to him, not to me. I've abdicated my role as a king and priest, Exodus 19, 6, as made in the image of Yah. Exodus 15, 3, Yahuwah is a warrior. Yahuwah is his name. People say, what's your life first, brother? That one. Because <laughs> we're fearfully and created in his image. He's a warrior. Who does Joshua run into on the road into the promised land? The messenger of Elohim, capital M messenger. Who's that? Yah made flesh. Mm, we call him Yeshua in the New Testament. And Joshua rolls up on this guy who's standing there with a sword in the middle of the road. And Joshua, sa Joshua says to him, are you for us or against us? I love this. And the messenger responds, you're for me, homie. And Joshua falls down and does obeisance. We know this isn't just some angel because everywhere the angels are like, get up, stop worshiping me. I'm just like you are. That's not what happens here. That was Elohim made flesh on earth, holding a sword to go slay the enemies of Israel. And you were created in that image. And we forget that. And so back to the, the definition of meekness, it's having the capacity for violence, righteous violence. Murder is not okay. Killing is. Read the Torah. There are some people that if they're trying to kill you, if you're trying to kill me, I'm going to kill you first. It's as simple as that. I didn't start this fight, but I will end it about that quick. Okay? That's biblical. We have a right to self-preservation. Israel beat your plowshares into swords. Ecclesiastes, there's a season for everything. So we need to acknowledge that as men. So having the capacity for violence, having a sword, an implied task, know how to use a sword. Because if you don't, you're going to hurt yourself, right? But balancing that with wisdom and discernment, right? Judge and judge righteously according to the law. And people will say, well, where's the grace and mercy in that? Well, the Torah says if you diddle kids, I get to hit you in the face with a rock. The grace and mercy is I didn't you're still alive. You still have breath in your lungs. So you can absolutely balance the teachings of the Torah against the grace and mercy, the favor of Mashiach, right? Torah says you're dead. Oh, you cheated on your husband? You're dead. What? We have Messiah. We have grace and mercy. We have wisdom and discernment from the Ruach HaKodesh. You're not dead, but you can't stay here because sin cannot exist inside the camp because I can't have Whatever spirit is it is in you that caused you to break this covenant relationship with your in, that you're in, you can't allow, I can't allow you to pass that to my wife, my daughters, my sisters. So you need to go over here. Why is there a city of refuge in the Torah? Because you made a mistake and we're not going to kill you, but you can't stay here. So you got to go over here to the city of refuge, get your poop in a group. And if you have legitimate teshuva, repentance, if you actually turn from your wicked ways, you confess those things, and I can see the fruits of your belief. You shall know them by their fruits. Not what they say, not what they pray, not what they think about, what do they do? James, Jacob, your belief is what you do, right? And I can see by what you're doing, that you've had a real turning, a real teshuva. Then at that point, we can have a conversation about maybe this person is allowable to be back around our people again, because I'm responsible for these people. And so back to the role of a man, we have to insulate ourselves and our family from all this wickedness that's out there and be indwelt by the Spirit for that wisdom and discernment that I can look at that thing, whatever it is, and balance it against the Word of God and go, that's not allowable. I'm not letting that into my home. We will not consort with that. While also having enough love and compassion to go, you need help. How can I help you deal with that thing that you're dealing with? But also, we're not going to deal with it in my house. And so, where this whole be a really nice guy concept came from. I don't know. 
but I've heard it preached my whole life in various different denominations. During that decade of apostasy that I was in playing drums, um, I never gave up on Yah. I always thought he was real. I was just incredibly pissed at him. And so if it's an anity or an ism, I've researched it heavily. Um, and it's way too many. There's 54,000 denominations of Christianity. Most of them revolve around usurp the authority of the man as the priest in his home and give that over to this guy over here and beseech him, this other man, for his blessing, his approval, his instruction. Uh, bro, we should all have one of these and be intimately familiar with what it says. Because the, the whole doctrine of Satan is predicated on, but did Yah really say? Go all the way back to the garden. Is that what God really said? And all it takes is just a little bit of twisting of the Father's words. And if you don't know what the word is, you don't have that wisdom and discernment, you're now way off track. When Yeshua is in the wilderness, Satan tempts him with scripture. So just because you see scripture coming out of somebody's face doesn't mean that person works for Yah. It just means they know what the Bible says. And so men being really nice guys, there's absolutely settings where it's at my kid's birthday party, I should be a really nice guy. <laughs> Visiting grandma, I should be a really nice guy. Uh, when somebody's trying to mug me in the parking lot, negative, sword upon your thigh. And what can men do to be more like that? Look at the images that we're given to emulate. Yeshua is Mashiach ben David in the line of King David prophesied in the Old Testament. David was a rock star, dude. He wrote poetry, he played the lyre, right? Like King Shaul, when the bad spirits were tormenting him, David would bust out his guitar and just start riffing, right? They also wrote songs about the tens of thousands of men that David killed, righteously. And again, I'm not an advocate for murder. But there, if somebody's trying to wipe you off the face of the earth, you have a biblical responsibility to not let that happen. And again, that begins inside of my own home with my own family for provision, protection, blessing, and then outward from there. Like, never come into this building with hate in your heart. Because my brothers will smoke you before the door swings closed. Right? Because they're men of Elohim. And so, having that capacity... And it is really important to men and being able to look at the biblical examples that were given of righteous men all throughout the work. Righteousness is defined in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, New Testament, blamelessly walking in the commands of Yah. I cannot do this perfectly. Y'all cannot do this perfectly. It's impossible for you or me to blamelessly, perfectly walk out the Torah. If I could do that, I'd be Mashiach. Because in him there is no sin, and sin is transgression of the law. 1 John 3, verse 4. Newsflash, I'm not Messiah, and neither are y'all. And if you are, great to meet you. I'm just pretty sure that you're not, okay? You're not some Jewish warlord over there in the Gog and Magog war. It's an entirely different conversation <laughs> based upon ortho yeah, Jewish orthodoxy. Anyway, um, we're not perfect. That's why we need Mashiach. That's why we need a Messiah in the first place. But I can blamelessly walk. That means to the best of my broken ability, crucifying my flesh every day, not listening to the negative self-talk and internal dialogue and letting demons whisper in my ear, or giving the enemy way too much credit, more than he deserves, I can blamelessly walk to the best of my ability in Yah's commands. That's righteousness. And we have examples of righteous men all throughout the word. Look at Father Abraham, right? Not perfect, but He's the father of three different international religions. Half the world's population can trace their beliefs back to Abraham, right? Isaac, Jacob, David, Bathsheba. Not cool, man. Uriah the Hittite has a smoking hot wife. Send him to the front line so he gets pin cushioned by the archers on the, other en or on the enemy's battlefield. And then now I can swoop in here and lay with his wife. That's not cool. Don't do that. But what did he do when that happened? He... His child that she was bearing was dying. And he went and laid at the footstool of the altar in the temple and beseeched Yah for a week. And then his handlers come to him and they say, paraphrasing, New Living Bear translation, uh, hey, your kid's dead. He dries his eyes, stands up. Father, Yah, let your will be done. He shoulders that burden responsibly. 
like a man. I've lost three children. It sucks. Shoulder that burden like a man, right? And then he says to Yah, whatever your will is, let it be done. And then he goes to Bathsheba and says, hey, I screwed this up royally. I treated you like a concubine. And the father has punished us because we were not in a covenant relationship. That's why he took our son from us. We need to be in a covenant relationship. I need to treat you like a wife. And then he marries her. They were biblically already married because they've done the deed. But a wife has an inheritance. A concubine does not. And who comes out of that union but King Solomon, the wisest man in all the world. And so we have multiple examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament of what it looks like to be a man of Elohim. They're not pushovers. They're not sopping wet P-words. Peter produces a sword and lops a guy's ear off in the Garden of Gethsemane because somebody got too close to the master. How many men today, if Yeshua was walking the face of the earth, and a, so a speron is the Greek word for the detachment that's sent to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's one-tenth of a legion. 600 men show up in the dark to arrest Yeshua. 600. It's not a handful of guys. 600 dudes show up. And there's 12 of us. And Mashiach is here. How many guys would produce their sword, shoulder their rifle, draw their pistol to deal with this in defense of Messiah? When is their time to be a really nice guy? Now, of course, in Yah's perfect plan, Yeshua says, hey, dude, sheathe your sword, chill. Hold on, your ear fell off? Let me fix that for you. Okay, you're good. I give up my life freely. No man takes it. I give it up freely. Just goes back to the binding of Isaac and the pattern of Isaac and the sacrifice that was to be made on Mount Moriah. There's patterns within patterns within patterns here. But my point is that biblical men, the good ones, are not pushovers. And they're subservient only to Elohim. And in today's day and age, we've created this artificial hierarchy of men who are seeking the approval and instruction of other men. And those men lord that over the men beneath them with domination, not dominion. There's not enough for proof and instruction. There's manipulation. And so I would just encourage everybody within the sound of my voice to open your Bible and read it and study it and do what it says to do and let no man come in between you and the Father. You have one intercessor. That's Messiah. That's it. Hebrews chapter 8, the renewed covenant. He is the intercessor, the go-between between us and the Father. Anybody else, anything else you put in between you and Yah that's not Yeshua, that is an abomination. It's a twisting of scripture and it's not allowable. We can have, should have structure and hierarchy. You can see biblical representation of elders and captains of tens, captains of fifties, hundreds, thousands, for sure, to lead the Father's people for reproof and instruction, for righteous judgment, but not to dominate each other. Because if I was made to be a king, Exodus 19.6, and you were made to be a king, do we get to tell each other what to do? And does that not inform Revelation 19, king of kings, lord of lords? You were made to rule and subdue. Provision, protection, blessing, meekness. Not to be a pushover. Not to just roll over and take it. And if more men would stand up and actually follow Elohim and actually follow the example of Yeshua and execute on the Father's will with their giftings and talents and delights, all of this nonsense that we see out in the world today wouldn't exist. It would be a non-permissive environment for sin. You go do that over there. You will not get away with it here. And so, sorry, another really long answer to your question. No, it's great, man. It's great. <laughs> I apologize. If it weren't all so great, I'd jump in, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll shut up. Sorry, Luke. <laughs> That's what it's about. It's about you talking. It's not about me talking. <laughs> I'm just the con question conduit. That's all I'll do is ask questions. So, and the next question I'd like to ask, just I guess we should shift gears a little and talk about, because you have five big things at least going on right now, right? Yes, sir. You have two ministries and three businesses. Is we have right? five businesses and two ministries. Yes, sir. Can <sighs> We call it the enterprise. <laughs> Can you tell us how you started this thing? You moved here. I'm guessing yep. it started when you moved here or were yep. you? Okay. You moved here. How, what did you start first and how did this happen? <sighs> My goodness. <laughs> this is going to be your first 18 hour long podcast. 
Um, <laughs> okay. So, like I said, we relocated from North Texas to Eastern Oklahoma. When we came out here, we were first alone. Um, and I was just crying out to y'all, why did you bring me here? Because we are all his children, and sometimes we are petulant children. <laughs> and his timeline's way longer than ours is. And we lack the perspective to see him moving the pieces on the chessboard, if you will. And so prior to moving here, um, I had started a YouTube channel. And I started a YouTube channel about preparedness because I watched a Canadian prepper video telling people to trespass into their neighbor's backyards to get water from their neighbor without permission if they ran out of water. I live in Texas. That's a guaranteed way to get shot. Like 100% that fast. I'll smoke you in my backyard because Texas. Uh, and so I'm telling my wife, hey, this is really bad information. This guy can't be saying that. If you haven't figured out by now, my wife's awesome. Um, what's up, babe? I love you. And uh, so she's like, well, shoot a video. So I don't want to shoot a video. She's like, well, then quit complaining about his video. And I said, well, I, I can't just let this stand. People are going to get smoked. That's bad tactics. And by the way, you should have water in your house. So we go back and forth for about a half an hour. And finally she goes, well, shoot a video or shut up. I said, okay. Again, talk about dominating this woman. No, dominion, right? I, and praise Yah, she is so strong. You know why Yah calls your help meet your rib? You, have you ever had a broken rib? I have. Most of them. It hurts to breathe. Every move you make hurts. There's nothing you can do when you have a broken rib that doesn't suck. And your ribs protect your innermost parts, right? And so I don't think it's an accident that Hava, Eve, is considered our rib. Because right? when your rib is busted, everything hurts. It's just wrong. You can't even sleep. Breathing is painful, right? And so, praise Yah, I have a badass rib. <laughs> and so, she tells me make a video, and so I make a video. I'm telling people, hey, don't trespass to go get water. That's stupid. And so, I guess I'm a YouTube content creator now. So, I start making videos, and a couple weeks in, my wife comes home from work one day, and she says, hey, babe, we got to talk. Oh, no. Like, what's up? She said, I've been watching some of your videos, and uh, they suck. Oh, I love you, too. Thanks. It's great to see you. Um, she said, you're trying too hard. Stop. Stop trying so hard. Just be yourself. People will love you, and if they don't, screw them. But stop trying so hard. Just be you. Okay. And so started making preparedness videos, and um, a friend of mine, Navy veteran, Squid, um, he came alongside me, and we had the Squid and Bear channel, and we'd talk about prepper stuff, and we'd touch on Bible stuff occasionally because I was a believer, he was a believer. And, um, and then we relocated to Oklahoma, and it was no longer the Squid and Bear show because Squid stayed in Texas. We moved to Oklahoma, and we didn't want to do the Skype Zoom thing. It wasn't our shtick. And so we rebranded the channel to Bear Independent, because uh, I was now solo, but also conceptually being independent of this broken, fragile beast system. I'm not giving my kids to this system. I'm not betting my life on this system. I've read enough of this book to know my hope, my belief is in Yah. That's it. And everything belongs to him. Every breath of air in your lungs, every penny in your bank account, the fuel in your car, your hands, your feet, it's all his for his purposes. And if you use those resources to do his will, Deuteronomy 28, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, then, if then, then you will be blessed. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. I didn't understand the overtaking part until we got to where we're sitting right now. So I moved to Oklahoma and I'm making these BS YouTube prepper videos. And I'm walking around outside one day, just living. Remember I told you I'm going to be pissed off. <laughs> and I'm pissed because I can feel the spirit pressing on me that there's something I need to be doing and I don't know what it is. And so I'm screaming. I have the audacity to scream at Yahuwah or Elohim. What the F, dad? I like, I'm stupid. And if you don't tell me what to do, I can't do it. And I don't want to be disobedient. So tell me what to do. 
clear as a bell, clear as a bell. I hear, read my word. I said, I am on camera, you idiot. I'm like floored at this point. I, I didn't sign up for that. I don't want to do that. Who am I? I'm nobody. I don't want it. Clear as a bell. Did I stutter? No, sir, you did not stutter. I will read your word. And so thus began the experiment of reading the Bible on a prepper channel on YouTube against all the advice of every professional consultant I've ever talked to about YouTube. You'll never grow the channel that way. You'll polarize your audience. And turns out the flip side of that is, uh, no, I will speak only to people that are ideologically in line with me and us or those who are curious to be with the added benefit of perhaps bringing people to Christ and back to Yah. Cool. Um, so I started reading, where do you begin? In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1. And I have since read all the way as the time of this recording through Ezekiel 37 in the Old Testament and every word of the New Testament on camera and all 54 weekly Torah portions on camera. Um, and that's not a brag. That's just Yah made me do it. And he's not going to let me stop at least as of the time of this recording, at least until I finish every word in the Bible and have re-recorded the Torah portions uh, for the masses. Because right now they're just out on Patreon. It started as part of the Patreon men's group that we were doing. And um, we'll just say my insight and depth of knowledge has grown in the last couple of years. And so once I finish the Old Testament on camera, I will begin uh, again on the Torah portions for YouTube, Bereshit. It's even that, there's a huge teaching just in the word Bereshit. Um, but, so I start reading the, the Bible on camera and I've got this little YouTube channel and people are telling me, Barrett, we want to support you. Please start something, a float plane or a Patreon or whatever. And so, all right, I'll start a Patreon page. And so people start coming alongside us and supporting us on Patreon for the work we're doing on YouTube. And I've always been of the opinion that you should never monetize the word of Yah. I think when you start mixing money and God together, it just creates an opportunity for sin and iniquity and your fleshly heart to get in the way. And so we've never monetized a single Bible video. Um, we've given away more than 6,000 copies of the scriptures donated. Um, and what people support me for overtly for on Patreon is for the prepper content, the Q and A stuff that we do and the, just the exclusive content there. But unlike a lot of other content creators, I am incapable of separating Yah and what he has done in my life from everything else. Mm. And so the channel has grown into, we, I read, I do a national Intel brief Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I still do pre-recorded prepper videos of what chest rig you should buy for SHTF and all that, all that stuff. Um, but I also read the Bible on camera and of the probably million, would you say we've gotten a million emails? Thus far, Monica, easily. We get ten to 15,000 emails a week. Yeah. Of the million plus emails that we've gotten, the best one I ever got was this guy wrote in. He said, Bear Man, I got you all figured out. You're just using this prepper stuff to get people to read their Bibles, ain't you? Yep. <laughs> Ding. You figured me out. And so... Um, on Patreon, we, uh, I did a quick poll. I said, hey, I want to produce some swag, t-shirts, stickers, patches, hoodies. And I had just made six first aid kits for myself. My brother Cody at Sojourn Gear, S-E-W-J-O-U-R-N Gear. Awesome tour observant artist, makes tactical gear out of ballistic nylon. Great brother. I paid him a thousand bucks to make me uh, an IFAC individual first aid kit because I couldn't find one that I liked on the market. And so I had just gone through this process of prototyping with him. And so I added IFAC first aid kit to the poll on Patreon. And in 24 hours, far and away, the most popular item on the poll was IFAC at 334 volt, vo votes. 
And what that told me, business acumen, was there's 334 potential customers for this product. Cool. Well, during that time, I had sent, I had six kits. I don't need six kits. Cody made me six kits. Sent one to uh, some Army Special Forces guys, and I sent one to some Air Force PJs. Give me your feedback. Tell me what you think. Well, the PJs wrote back first, and they were like, these things are awesome. The one issue we're having is that when you get them wet, they're hard to get out of the pouch, so maybe make the pouch just a little bit larger. Cool, got it. Also, we'll take 50 of them. What? Hey, Cody, I need 50 more kits. SF comes back, they're like, we love these things. Here's a couple of tweaks. We'd like 100 of them. Okay. And so I'm working an hour a month in my barn, which barn sounds cool. It's missing a wall. Okay. It's, <laughs> it's barely a structure. It, one half of it leaks. So I'm in the corner of it, packing first aid kits while shooting videos and doing live streams for Patreon. And uh, it just kept growing and growing growing and so in four years we've gone from my barn to four continents with refuge medical refuge is refuge kits are directly responsible for saving 93 lives to date that we know of in addition to 15 lives here in the state of oklahoma that have been saved through the project tribute foundation so well over 100 people are still here because our team showed up for work uh, thousands of law enforcement officers tens of thousands of civilians all across the country and as an outshoot of Refuge Medical, we started Refuge Training because I felt that it was negligent to not have a utility that we can use to teach people how to use these kits as well. And so as a result, Refuge Training in the last couple of years has trained more than 4,000 people across the country and tens of thousands online. And so that's how Patreon Bear Independent got going. Um, and again, Pastor Joe, pivotal in my life. When the YouTube channel was small, had a couple thousand subscribers. Me and my wife had shot some video. I think it was tactical mulberry picking. I've got this chess rig on and she's picking mulberries. And it was like the two worlds collide. You know, she's doing the cutesy homesteader stuff. And I've got a rifle and a chess rig. And I'm shoving pockets full of mulberries or whatever. And Pastor Joe had shared that out to his audience and said, hey, it's a cool couple. You might check them out. Well, the channel went from like 2,000 subscribers to 10,000 subscribers in a week. And I had a little girl moment. I was like, oh my gosh, Barry Patrick, yo, shout out to sell you. Doing one of these in the kitchen. And uh, and it just kept gaining steam and momentum. And as of the time of this recording, we're pushing 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, and Refuge Medical, Refuge Training. So Bear Independent, Refuge Medical, Refuge Training. I have a consultancy as well that is full that I don't talk about. I, I got plenty of people to work with already, so I'm not shilling for that. Um, and then the fifth business is a cutout that we use for one of our two ministries. And so I guess we'll talk about the ministries. Um, four years ago, Hurricane Michael hit Panama City, Florida. And I was supposed to be on the phone with a client, and the client had to push. And so I pulled my phone open, and I was scrolling through emails, which is literally not my job. There's four people on staff that their job is to manage the email load. So I don't scroll through emails. They read the emails, they forward them to me. Uh, Here, boss, this is what you need to see. A couple thousand emails a day is too much. And so I'm just scrolling through emails, and there's this one subject line is, Bear, we need help. So I pop it open, and it's a guy named the Reverend Gilbert Abreu with Night Runner's Crisis Response in Florida, talking about how... Um, they're in Panama City, and Panama City is not getting the help that it needs. Will you, uh, can you reach out? Can you help us? Cool. And so I'm supposed to be on the phone anyway. So I call him. Hey, Rev, it's Bear. What's going on? Dude, we were on the phone for five minutes. A minute and a half of it was him praying for me, and the other minute and a half was me praying for him. And it was two minutes of, yeah, we're coming. I don't know when. I don't know how. We'll figure it out. We're coming. Okay. And so through Patreon and all the awesome Patreon supporters, we raised 3000 bucks to fund this first mission out to Florida. Rented a minivan, filled it full of food. Um, I'm not into numerology, but I'm into biblical numerics. Three. 3000 bucks. rented a minivan, 
drove 3,000 miles round trip. There was me and 32 other Bear Nation supporters there, 33 of us. We fed 3,000 people over the course of three days, came home again, and still had 3,000 bucks in the bank account. I, to this day, don't know how that happened. It was like, literally, like multiplying loaves of bread. It's like, cool, we still have three grand, we're going back. And so, a really good brother of mine said, hey, that stuff you did in Florida was cool, I wanna go with you. I said, awesome. And so we take a convoy of some of our men from here out to Florida and we go back and we're there again. And um, this time there were 66 people there, literally twice as much as the first time around. And it was incredible, um, just feeding people in the community and houses that have been abandoned for five months, no electricity, no water, no sewer, uh, these entire neighborhoods that the federal government just gave up on and left. Made a woman cry, uh, go into the absolute ghetto, and we've got a trailer, just a utility trailer filled with hot meals, about 300 hot meals and styrofoam, uh, you know, foldovers, clamshells they call them. And we're just handing them out in bags of groceries to people. And this woman comes out of the house. She's like, what do you got? So we got hot food, ma'am. Hand her hot food. She's holding it, falls down in the middle of the street crying. So her mom is watching from the porch. She didn't know who we are. She didn't know what just happened. So she comes running over to her daughter. Baby, are you okay? She goes, Mama, they got hot food. They both start crying. They hadn't had a hot meal in five months. Bull yeah, the government will save me. Yeah, okay. Mm. Sorry for the rough language. And so the father impressed upon me, you need to do more of this. Okay. So we started Grindstone Ministries. As iron sharpens iron, so one brother sharpens the face of his friend. Iron is useless if it's dull. And a dull knife is the most dangerous thing you can have. Iron has to be sharpened. And so Grindstone is a disaster relief and construction outreach ministry that has several hundred volunteers across the nation that show up and donate their time. We don't bill homeowners, we don't bill townships, we don't bill FEMA, we, we're 100% privately funded. We have the same authority as the American Red Cross. I can do whatever the I wanna do and go wherever I wanna go. And we go bless people, feed people, fix their homes, pull the trees off of their houses. In some, many cases, smash their houses into a pile because that's all that's left. So they don't have to take some of their insurance money and pay to have their house destroyed so they can get another one. Or if they have no insurance at all, in many cases, we smashed their house into a pile, scraped it off of the land, and put another house down so they've got a place to live, all privately funded by the Bear Nation. I saw a couple years ago, three years ago now, we were at a place called Bethany House. Bethany House had reached out to us, and they are a juvenile human trafficking survivor restoration ministry. And they have a significant facility that uh, another ministry partnered with them on. And what on the surface looked like an absolute blessing, the place was just falling apart. And so they had been struggling to get it built so that they could house kids there for recovery. And so we crossed paths with them and Grindstone's purview began as fixing the floors in one half of one building. I don't know if you've ever remodeled a house, bro, but the floors touch the walls, which touch the roof, which touches the outside veneer, which touches the foundation that's got plumbing and electrical and sewer in it. And so scope <laughs> creep, righteous scope creep. Man, we had 60 to 100 people there, all volunteer for weeks. And the father just kept providing and kept providing and kept providing. And it was a blessing to be able to help them with anything that needed HVAC, electrical, plumbing, their well, their sewer systems, all the buildings just Whatever we could do, we did. Um, very, very Acts chapter two. People just showed up. Like literally, we'd, we'd be looking at an, an air conditioner, you know, a big pedestal mount air conditioner, five ton unit for this building going, I, I don't know what's wrong with it. And the HVAC guy would pull up and be like, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, uh, we're trying to fix this thing. He goes, oh, hold on. Yeah, I got that part on the truck. Just that over and over and over again. And so, Second to last day on property, 
I'm walking outside from the building that we'd all been housed in. We're bunking in, and it's a beautiful, crisp morning. Sky's blue, little lofty clouds up there. And I'm just talking to Jan. I'm like, thank you for this. This is incredible. Please bless this place. The world needs this. And again, that voice. You're right. We need more of this. And you're going to build them. What? I don't know anything about building these. I mean, I the, the building, yeah, I'll pick a building. I'll build you, build it for you right now. Not a problem. But I don't know anything about restoring children. I don't know anything about building a team that's going to restore children. I don't know about the legalities of this. I don't know. Yeah. Trust in me, son. You're building more of these. Okay. So we started our second 501c3 Caleb house. I see 90% of all money in the U.S. that is spent on anti-human trafficking is spent on awareness, which pisses me off because I already know there's a freaking problem. And I don't really care if you watch The Sound of Freedom or not. We live it every day. I don't want to hear about it. I already know about it. I know stuff about what happens to children that would make you puke on the floor right now. I don't need awareness. The other 10% is spent on rescue. And rescue is really important because we've got to get these kids out of there. Zero percent is spent on restoration. We're commanded in the book of Deuteronomy. If, if you forsake the widow and the orphan, then your wife will be a widow and your children will be orphans. Copy. And so we set out to build Caleb House which is a restoration facility for juvenile human trafficking survivors. That's a bunch of $50 words for it's a place where we put broken children back together again after they've been serially raped by assholes. And in the process of building Caleb House, we got a phone call. T, we have people that need to get out now. I'm up, drop me a pen, I'm coming. Getting back to Men of Elohim, I hadn't sent the text message that I needed help before my truck was already full of men. Not grown ass boys, men. Who knew nothing other than we need to go get orphans and it's dangerous. Bring your armor. And so we did. And we went and pulled a bunch of people out without having a place to put them. So we established a network of safe sites where we keep these people and we meet their every need, mental, physical, emotional, financial, educational, spiritual. And these children, dude, I have children in my care ages 1 to 19, dozens of them right now. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against nations and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. You have better to be a man of Elohim when the enemy comes knocking on your door to hurt your children. Because if you're not, you might as well just hand them over. And so we 100% got the cart before the horse because we didn't have a facility built yet. But I'm not saying no to a bunch of children that are getting so we went and pulled them out. And then we got another phone call, and another phone call, and another phone call. And I've got some of the older children that we pulled out asking us, how do we do what you do? Do I need to be a cop? Should I be an EMT? Like, do I join the military? What prerequisites do I need to do what you do? And I asked them why. What, why do you need to know? And with tears in their eyes. They said, because we still have friends back there and we need to go get them out. And so we started Caleb House 501c3, not-for-profit organization, 100% privately funded, never taken a dime from the federal government, state government, local government, not one bit, because I'm not going to have them tell us what we can and can't do or some BS rules that we have to follow. Timmy feels like Tina today, so you gotta go house him in the girls' housing unit. We're not doing that. 
And so we have actively taken a stand against human trafficking, specifically juvenile human trafficking. And it puts targets on our backs and I don't care, not even a little bit. My God is God. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Am I, am I such a sop and wet P word that I'm so concerned about my own safety and well-being that I can't go over here and do the righteous thing and forsake not the widow and the orphan? Or do I really believe that this is Yah's will and therefore he will bless it? And he has. And it has been incredibly humbling to see who has come along, come alongside us to support us in the doing of this. Um, dude, pick an alphabet soup agency. They've had people who've lent a hand. Um, pick a top tier military unit. They have people who've lent hands. Um, just and it it seems like well I'm not an operator. How do I help? Dude, we have one guy who owns an energy company in Louisiana. I was like, hey, do you need a dozer? Yeah, I do, because we have to do dirt work to build this place. Cool, here's a dozer. Hey, I noticed you guys were praying over an excavator. You need an excavator? Yeah, okay, cool, here's an excavator. Um, and it's, I guess it's been an experiment in righteous crowdfunding, right? <laughs> and it's, dude, it's so humbling to see how the Father has moved and, and who has stepped up to come alongside us to be a blessing on this mission to restore these kids. Because the, the critical need is restoration. Rescue is cool. Rescue is what everybody gets off on. I'll put my plate carrier on and get a rifle and we're gonna breach this door and throw a couple of flashbangs, run in here and rescue all the kids. Roger, cool. Dude, that takes a, a few hours to a few days to plan and 15 minutes to execute if you're clean. What do I do with a four-year-old? I've got this kid until they're a man or a woman. I'm not putting them in the foster care system because 78% of kids that are trafficked come out of the foster care system. I'm not giving them to the state because the state is responsible for it. Dude, I could make you puke on the floor right now. So there has to be some type of righteous intervention. There has to be a place where we can bring these kids. And we use a house parents model where we have parents in a house and the kids that come into this house, they're your kids. And you shall raise them up in the way that they should go so they do not depart from it when they're older. And if Yah brings you a four-year-old, man, you got 14 to 16 years with that kid. Praise Yah. Or a 15-year-old, okay. When they're ready to fly the coop, they're ready to fly the coop. We just had about, praise Yah, about a dozen people graduate from our program, which is incredible because we don't even have the facility built yet. And because Yah is badass, dude. Yahuwah is a warrior. Yahuwah is his name. And they're grown. They've flown the coop. They're still our kids. Just like my son, when he grows up and moves out of my house, that's still my son. Whatever he needs, pick up the phone, call me. How can I help you? whether it's just a word of encouragement or a bit of advice or a couple of bucks or a place to crash tonight, whatever, that's my son. I love my son. And these are our kids and we're raising them up because nobody else is doing it. And I never intended to get involved in anti-human trafficking, not even a little bit. Ignorance is bliss, bro. I knew very little about it and I have been forced to learn a lot about it, a lot about it in a very short period of time, because the scale and scope of this thing is insane. It's a hundred and fifty billion dollar a year industry. It's estimated that somewhere between four hundred and six hundred thousand children a year are used specifically to produce CSEM child sexual exploitation material. That's just the ones that are on camera. Here in the states, four hundred to six hundred thousand a year. There's 420 DHS sanctioned beds in the entire country for recovery. 27,000 children a month go missing in the United States of America. And there's a huge trend in the trafficking and abuse of infants and toddlers because they're nonverbal, so therefore they can't testify in court. 
And so, somebody has got to do something about this. And we are, to the best of our ability. I will not let that shit stand. I cannot let that stand. Somebody has to do something about it. And praise God, we're not the only ones. But there are far too few of us fighting back against a $150 billion a year industry. And if more men had balls and just stood up when they saw something that was unrighteous and did something about it, and I don't mean make an Instagram post or rant on Facebook, I mean do something about it, we would have heaven on earth. This would be a non-permissive environment for sin. So that's the five businesses and the two ministries. Wow. <laughs> Well, we have to talk more about Caleb House because I have a lot of questions about that. Well, first, just pragmatically, what what is something you always need? Just money, definitely. What else? We need a constant covering of prayer for the victim services teams. Um, it's very stressful for the children, but it's also very stressful for the people who are helping the children. They have these kids have been broken in every way possible. Many of them have been victims of satanic ritual abuse. It's terrible. Um, so prayer for the victim services team, prayer for the children, prayer for the operators in the field, um, you know, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper and that there will be restoration in the name of Yah by the blood of Yeshua. That's first and foremost. Money's obvious. It costs four hundred dollars to $500,000 to build a care house. Our goal is to have 10 of them on this property at Caleb House. Uh, property is secured. Dirt work is ongoing. We are, I'm meeting with the builder for the first care house this afternoon when I get done with y'all. Um, but I intend to put 10 ish houses on this first piece of property, which will allow us to house about 60 children on site. And then when Caleb house one is done, construction on Caleb house two begins and Caleb house 27, 863, 912 until we have worked ourselves out of a job. I will make this place a non-permissive environment for sin. I have to. I am not going to let this continue to happen to children. Or my wife will be a widow. My children will be orphans. And so, yeah, all that takes money. Cool. If the Spirit convicts you to give, give. If the Spirit doesn't convict you to give, I don't want a dime from you. Because I don't ever want to be working counter to the Spirit. And it all belongs to Yah anyway. And so sometimes when it feels like we haven't gotten what we need, that's an exercise in patience and faith that the Father is working on something way better. You're over here asking Dad if you can have an applesauce and he's cooking you a T-bone. Wait, <laughs> I got something better coming for you, right? Um, and the other thing that we really need is, as much as I hate the concept of awareness, if people could help evangelize for Caleb House, Caleb with a K, calebhouse.org. And Caleb is one of my favorite biblical men of Elohim. Caleb, son of Yefuna, of the tribe of Judah. One of two spies that gives a righteous report of the land. The other being Yahushua, Hoshea, Joshua, of the tribe of Ephraim. Ezekiel 37, the binding of the two sticks. The house of Judah, the house of Ephraim. Why? No bad reports on the land. And so after five years of open warfare in the promised land, the land is settled by the sword of Joshua. And Caleb says, hey, bro, I like that mountain, Hebron. Can I take it? Joshua says, New Living Bear translation, if you can take it, you can have it. But the sons of the Anakim, the descendants of the Nephilim are up there. There'd be giants up in those hills, bro. Be careful. And Caleb looks at Joshua and says, dude, I am as good today as I was the day that Moshe tapped us on the shoulder and sent us into the promised land. He was 40 years old when that happened. He's 85 years old now. And Caleb goes up the mountain with his boys and he slays giants in the promised land. That's what we're doing. We are in open warfare against a $150 billion a year industry with zero government support, no official cover for action, 100% supported by five and 10 and $20 bills that come in 
and frankly, the success of Refuge Medical. We have we have war chested the crap out of some operations because Refuge Medical had a good month. And so, prayer, pray for the people who are out there doing this stuff. Pray for those kids. Um, and if the Father has put being involved in the restoration on your heart, we need house parents. We need house parents. And it is a very challenging job. You will cry. You will lose your patience. You may lose your temper. But nothing worth doing is easy. And we in modern Christendom have conflated easy and good. Yeshua, when he says, I come to bring life and life abundantly, doesn't mean you're going to get a Lambo. That's not what that means. It means you are going to have the fullness of life. And just because it ain't easy doesn't mean it's not good. And I firmly believe the works that we are doing are good. And it is my intention at the end of an age to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And we're going to keep doing this until literally I'm dead. That's my goal. So. I wonder, I feel like this is a big question, and I'm, but I'm sure you've thought about it, given the fact that you're involved in this. Why has this grown? Why has human trafficking of children grown? Because I have read that it has. What is the root cause as far as you've seen? And maybe you don't know, but. So human trafficking is predominantly a white crime. That's the first thing. 85% of people who engage in human trafficking and or consume CSIM, child sex, sexual exploitation material, 85% uh, of them are white males ages 29 to 45. Uh, Yeshua says in Matthew 24, and because of the increase in lawlessness, the love of many shall grow cold. Uh, nobody is holding these people accountable. There is no federal uh, statutes. There are very few federal statutes on the books that allow for a hardcore prosecution. And most of these are federal crimes because they take place across state lines. And so if it happens inside of the state, like for example, Oklahoma, depending on the circumstances, Oklahoma will kill you back. Texas will kill you back. And again, I think every American citizen has the right to a free trial. You have the right to redress your grievances, 100%. Torah says in the mouths of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Well, if I can put nine on the stand, Torah says I get to hit you with a rock, bro. The mercy is, again, because of Yeshua, you ain't dead. But if you get put into prison and somebody accidentally slips a sharpened toothbrush in your kidney, forgive me if I don't feel very compassionate for you. Um, but there's very few federal statutes on the books. There's also very little interest, being perfectly frank, with the Department of Homeland Security, who has oversight on human trafficking, to even get involved in most cases. A lot of them get kicked over to uh, the feds, the FBI, and there are good people, contrary to popular belief, there are good people in both of those agencies, but their workload, their caseload is huge. Next, you have to find a judge who's willing to actually throw the book at these people. And in many cases, they're not. There was a um, police chief in Pennsylvania who was the single largest holder of CSIM in the state of Pennsylvania with several thousand hours of film of children, nonverbal pre-K children being brutally raped and murdered on camera and more than 600,000 images. He got six years in jail. Six. Did you steal my truck? You're going to get more than six years in jail. And so even when you can find somebody who will prosecute, yeah, and part of what Caleb House does operationally is we develop, we develop undeniable target packets that we drop on the desks of people that are out there making stuff happen with badges and guns. That's a huge part in how we contribute with the fight on that side when it comes to offenders. As uh, I will pattern the life of you till I know I know what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning before you do. 
and I'll put all that information together and pass it to somebody who has authority in your jurisdiction to go roll you up and make your life a living hell. And then when you stand in front of the judge, here's all this intel that happens to document everything that you've ever done for the last however long. And here's all these witnesses. And uh, not to stack the cards against you, but to make sure that the victims are hurt and that that person gets the book thrown at them. Um, so federally, very few statutes that apply. On the state level, you need to have people that are actually willing to prosecute this. And a lot of that's just a function of caseload. And then there are no reporting requirements at the federal level for anybody inside, anybody with a .mil or .gov email address. They are not required to report anything. So we don't have statistics, not for the United States of America. There, are, There is oddly a bunch of data missing for the U.S. Other places, Netherlands, France, Germany, Australia. Australia keeps really good records on this. Um, elsewhere in Europe, Russia, they keep records and statistics on this stuff. Not in the U.S. At some point, you're complicit, bro. Um, we have had people within the federal government who have come to us directly and said, you need to stop because this goes all the way to the top. Joke's on you, bro. I'm no respecter of men. I work for y'all. What are you going to do, kill me? Hey, what's up, Yeshua? It's great to meet you. I would like a battle axe. Let's go slay some demons. I'm up. Right? Because my God is God. And he will take care of my wife and children. What am I so worried about? Oh, it goes all the way to the top. That's literally, we've been told that from multiple sources inside of the federal government. Stop. You're playing with fire. This goes all the way to the top. Stop messing with it. Cool. Playing with fire. I know a guy named Elijah who can call that stuff out of the sky. It's pretty awesome. He uses it to slaughter false prophets. Checks out. And so it's... The nation is so far fallen. Nobody wants to know. Nobody wants to know that children are being brutally, brutally victimized. More than half of trafficking, by the way, trafficking just means exploitation. So we have this concept of kids being herded in like cattle into a, the back of a semi truck and driven across a border. And that does happen. That does happen. But more than half of people who are trafficked know the person who trafficked them. Mom doesn't have meth money, so she pimps out her 11 year old. Grandma can't afford her medications. So she's out of the house for an hour while the uncle comes over to hang out with the five-year-old. And now she can afford, it's, they know these people. And that's part of family court. You have fathers who are pimping out their wife and children, raping them, producing CSAM, recording it, distributing it, that are also suing for custody of their children in family court because the mom finally grew the balls to get a divorce. The court systems are broken. And again, I'm not advocating for violence, but my soul longs for the day where we all follow Yah's word. Because Israel had some very strong pronouncements about how we handle people like that. Yeshua himself said in Matthew 18, 6, it would be better for you if I tied a millstone around your neck and pushed you into the ocean, then you harm one of these little ones. That would be better than letting Messiah get his hands on you if you do this to your children. Going back to biblical manhood, dominion versus domination. How dare you treat your children like that? They don't belong to you. You steward them. They belong to Yah. And if they didn't have a purpose, he would have never created them in the first place. And so even battling back from that with these kids, why? Why did God allow this to happen to me? And the best thing I can come up with, with my limited understanding in this, is that, sorry, kid, but first of all, Yah can heal all things, including this. He's sovereign over everything, including this. Next, who has a better witness and testimony for the next generation of kids that we rescue than you do. Because you've been there. You know it. You know exactly what this person is going through. 
And so, you know, our, you are best equipped in life to help the person that you used to be. That's why our message resonates with so many heathens, because I was one, right? And so I don't know, I don't know why the Father allows these things to happen, but I do know I'm seeing with my own eyes that these children that have been rescued or in the process of being restored are the best equipped people I've ever met to witness to the next kids that we bring in. And so we have to, this is a generational curse. This is learned behavior. Statistically, each victim is responsible for 80, I'm sorry, each perpetrator, each victimizer is responsible for 82 victims. Not incidents, 82 victims. We have to break that generational curse because the victimizer learned it from somewhere. Well, when you are past the age of accountability, sorry, but you're part of the problem. But these victims, we call them survivors. We have to put them back together again. We have to break this generational curse, this learned behavior so that they don't go out there and each one of them create 82 more victims. And so it's a two front war, both on jamming up the victimizers, making sure they never see the light of day again and fixing the survivors so that they don't go out and victimize, terrorize more people. That's part of why there's such exponential explosion growth in this mm -hmm. is because of the rate at which this learned behavior is being disseminated. 82 victims per offender. That's, you know, count it a life well lived if you save one for Christ. One. These people are wrecking 82 children, each statistically, some way more than that in a lifetime. And somebody's got to push back against that tide. And so if you can deprogram that bad learned behavior and reprogram good learned behavior so that the thing that happened to you is now part of your testimony, not part of your trauma, and equip and empower those kids to go out there in the world and be the light. I, I don't know another way to fight against it. And I, I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't have this all figured out. But I would much rather figure it out while doing it than sit on the sidelines and wait for a perfect plan while children are being raped all around me. Will not stand for that. I'm so glad you're doing it. Great more, job. more of us need to do it. So how, where, where can people go to find more about this and help you uh, in this effort? And then also, where else can people find you? Um, so calebhouse.org, Caleb House with a K. We are nationally registered 501c3, legit organ, organization. All of our reporting's up there, blah, blah, blah. Like, we're legit. We're not just a bunch of cowboys. <laughs> um, grindstoneministries.com is our disaster and construction ministry. Uh, Bear Independent, B-E-A-R, Independent, YouTube, Patreon, website, refugemedical.com, refugetraining.com. Um, and if you're, if you're going to reach out to us and you don't know Yah and you need a copy of his word, admin at grindstoneministries.com. Just tell me where to send you a Bible. That's all I need to know. I don't need to know why you can't afford it or what's going on in your life. Just... Send me an address. Where can I send you a copy of the scriptures? And we have been absolutely blessed. Like I said, we buy scriptures by the pallet now so we can turn around and give them away because of how awesome the Father is and how awesome our supporters are in the Bear Nation. So that's where you can get a hold of me. How do you feel to know that there's a group of men with masculinity becoming less and less? that people are also outsourcing their masculine traits to a group of people where if there is trouble or if there is difficulty, there's somebody else to take care of that. And how do you feel, I would assume, bearing some of the burden of that? It's a tough line to walk. It really frustrates me some days. Um, I, dude, I wear my heart on my sleeve and I'm really not good at policing my speech. And I have come to at least be able to say, don't thank me, help me. It pisses me off when people are like, thank you for what you do. 
bro, you go do something. If I can do it, you can. Right? And so when it comes to faith, outsour- you, one cannot outsource their relationship to the creator. There's, o- there's only one way, by the blood of the Son. It's as simple as that. And again, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't have learned elders and I shouldn't have brothers for reproof and instruction. I should because I don't have it all figured out. And maybe you've seen a different part of the path than I have. And I'm fixing to walk up on this part and it's dangerous. And you need to let me know so that I don't trip and fall and bust my on that dangerous part. In faith, we can't abdicate the throne of responsibility, but we can be reproved and instructed. When it comes to doing violence, if you will, and having violence done to the kingdom of heaven, the strong men have to stand in the gap. And in many ways, we all organizationally outsource that. Mm-hmm. Your taxes pay for the U.S. military. Praise Yah. I'm glad to know that there's strong men and women who are out there standing in the gap. Your taxes pay for law enforcement. Praise Yah. Same reason. Um, your taxes don't pay for your home. They don't pay for the influence you have in your community. They don't pay for the responsibility that you have. And so w- there are demarcations. I'm not going to go put on my armor and go fight in Israel. Not my job. But I can put on my armor and fight here. And I don't mean that metaphorically, Ephesians 6. I mean literally. There is armor in my truck right now. Because there are people, given the opportunity, who would love to kill me because I've hurt their bottom line because these children are their product. Uh, I disagree. These children are children, and we don't sell children. And so, I think radically analyzing your life and looking for areas where one can take and should take personal responsibility is really important because your mirror, your your problems are staring you in the face in your mirror every day. My biggest problem is not who's in the White House or what's happening in the Middle East. It's me. I'm my biggest problem. And if I can get my shit under control, get out of my own way, and do the right thing, the righteous thing, it's a win. And that comes down to personal responsibility and fearlessly auditing yourself to shine at the best disinfectant and sunshine. The light shines into the darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Illuminate all the places where you're falling short, all the places where you're capitulating, you're compromising, and then act on those. We call this positions of strength. I gotta be squared away here before I come help you because I can't give you something I don't have. If you need peace and I'm not peaceful, there's no way I can give it to you. If you need strength and I'm not strong, there's no way I can give it to you. So I got to be squared away here. Otherwise, I will bring you dysfunction. I'll make your problem worse. And then by being strong here, that allows me to bring strength or peace or compassion or violence when needed to those situations because I'm good here. And the, the relationship structure structures me and Yah. Then me, Yah, my wife. And me, Yah, my wife, my kids. Now this is my household. This is my tent. And then out from there, I've got maybe my community, my faith group, the county I live in, the state that I live in, the country that I live in, planned earth. A lot of people aren't squared away at all in their home, but they're worried about what's happening on this outer sphere of planet earth. Yeah, dude, but did you clean your room? Did you take the trash out? Have you spent time in your word today? Right? Is your knife dull? Are you filled with your own BS rather than the Father's righteousness to the best of your ability? You get this right first, your relationship with Yah right first, and then everything trickles out from there. And again, reproof and instruction and learned brothers are really important to help maintain that relationship. But I can't, I will not stand between you and you at the end of an age because every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess you might be my brother but i'm not your intercessor that's y'all's job that's your shoe's job rather i'll be weeping and gnashing my teeth next to you on the floor confessing every messed up thing that i've ever done and you don't get to stand for me so we can help each other but we can't take domination over one another and i can't take accountability for you either. 
And once you realize that, it absolves you of responsibility over everybody other than what you can control, what you should control, and what Yah has blessed you to steward. Now, I'm an ordained pastor now. That's an odd place to be for a guy who loves four-letter words. But I'm learning how to navigate it. And so now I am accountable and responsible for the flock that's underneath me. But I still don't get to run their house. Bill over here is still priest of his home. That's still his wife. Those are still his children. And they all belong to Yah. So I might help steward Bill. Dominion, not domination. But if Bill decides to fly off the deep end and join a Wiccan cult and not, he made that choice. I can help lead him away from that. So understanding gates and fences and boundaries and what I'm responsible for and executing on that, what I'm not responsible for, what's none of my damn business, not executing on that, then operating in strength with all of that. And I don't simply mean, when I say strength, I don't mean how much can you deadlift. Although you should be doing that too. It's good for your body. I mean, how much strength do you have in here? Like, you cannot talk me out of the fact that Yah is real and that he loves us. You cannot talk me out of the fact that Yeshua is real and that he loves us. You cannot talk me out of the fact that this word is true because I know it in here. The foundational cornerstones. If you have that, everything else is just a downstream function of those three things. And that allows me to be strong. Because if I hear somebody talking some bull that doesn't align with this i know it's not true next i hear somebody or see somebody trying to separate me from yah or separate me from yeshua that's bs not going to play that game next and i stay here centered to the best of my ability in yah walking in his will per the example of yeshua because i got too much stuff on my plate dude i don't have time for the distractions right i could i could meddle with your bs over here that you don't want to fix anyway. You just want somebody to listen to you cry. Or I could be over here saving lives, rescuing kids, spending time with my family. Right? And a lot of, I'll end with this. I had a question on a live stream last night about banishing demons, which can absolutely be done. Um, somebody said, Can you banish a demon that somebody doesn't want to get rid of? For a time you can. That's why Yeshua talks about this parable of the house. And that a strong man comes and he opens the door and this person leaves. They come back with seven others to find that the house has been cleaned and swept and set in order. And now all seven of them come in. Somebody isn't willing to give up their BS. It doesn't matter how many times I speak the name of Yeshua to you. How many times I command that thing to flee. I can make it flee. But you're going to invite it back the moment I leave. What's the point of that? I've cast demons out of people, lay hands on them, pray on them, and I can feel three of the five leave. The other two, they're not ready to let them go yet because they're still too comfy playing house with these demons. Mm -hmm. And so we do have power and authority over all things in the name of Yeshua. We're supposed to execute in that power and authority for the will of Yah. For his glory. I can sweep your house out. If you fill it up full of shit again, that's your problem, not mine. Would you like to add anything else at all? Is there anything I forgot to ask? No, you've been great. And I really appreciate your time. And I know I'm long-winded. So, uh, when you see evil as a man, do not capitulate. Do not. Knowing you're not perfect. You're never going to be. Knowing you don't have it all figured out, you're never gonna. But act and act righteously. The world is starving for men. Starving for men to shoulder the burden of responsibility and walk in righteousness to the best of their broken ability. Thank you, sir. Bless you, brother. Thank you so much. Well, that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this. Thank you, Bear, to, for taking the time to do this interview. It was a lot of fun. And as always, this and all of these podcasts are brought to you by and sponsored by all of the things that we've made, like the Way documentary, the Truth book, and 
these new truth tracts which are out. All of them can be found at thewaydoc.com if you're interested. And stay tuned because we will be doing more of these.